Welcome, Sean. Thank you. It's good to see you. It's so it's nice to see you. It's been some years. Yeah. Um, so f first, I'm going to introduce Chelio really quickly so he can start sure. doing the artwork. Um, Chelio and I uh, had an exhibit together at the Venice Biennale for humanizing the icon with a group of artists um, exploring this paradigm of icon and deconstructing identity from like religion to pop culture. Mm -hmm. um, and this was all spawned from the birth of my Mary Pickford film, who was the mm -hmm. first uh, American cinema icon. For sure. So Chelio, as we can see in the background, does beautiful artwork. And he is going to be um, transforming this <laughs> uh, which the people on Facebook can see, oh not on Instagram, and can catch on the YouTube episode later. But um, hi, Chelio. Hi, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Sean. And then great uh, today's, and then we join this uh, nice, beautiful conversation, okay? Thank you so much. Okay. I'm gonna and talk then, to you at the end. Yeah, I okay. go through in my work. You go into the portal now. Okay. Okay, <laughs> thank See you. you later. Okay, okay. Um, so Sean, are we, are you good with audio? I'm good. Ready to okay, go. Okay, amazing. Um, so yeah, I thought first we could just talk about our backstory, how sure. we met. What is your memory of that? <laughs> <clears throat> so my memory of that is that I think we met at a restaurant called La Esquina. Am I right? Oh, Remember? Yes. And yes. it was this really groovy restaurant where you kind of go into this little dive restaurant you go through the kitchen and down these stairs and there's this like whole cool restaurant lounge kind of clubby vibe and I we met and <clears throat> it was either you or it was Julie Pacino who was telling me about the project that you guys were going to do and uh, oh. you know of course like every actor my first uh, my first question was what's my role <laughs> and uh, yes. you know how and you know, how many times do you meet somebody at a bar or out to dinner and they tell you that they're gonna put you in a movie and they actually do it and you guys did. And uh, you know, um, I flew in from LA and it was an amazing, it was an amazing experience. I'd never uh, filmed in New York before. And uh, it was tremendous working with you, working with Julie, uh, you know, filming on the streets of New York and in the, the amazing, um, didn't, didn't we film in the church where they did The Godfather? Yes, in uh, and, Anita. Yeah, and wasn't Julie actually Michael Corleone's baby? Didn't she play the baby? No, I don't think Julie did. She did. did she? I thought she told me she did. I thought Maybe I don't know that story. Did. Okay, <laughs> I well, might not know anyway. that story. But it was, it was really a tremendous experience, and I was really happy with um, uh, the final product and, and you know, getting a chance to work with uh, Beth Grant was mm -hmm. fantastic. So was the best. Yes. She played my mom and I played mm -hmm. some kind of very dark you were great in it too. <laughs> character. Very yeah. And it's online. It's called Avracadabra. Yeah. Anyone can yeah. check it out. Um, and Ty show. Simpkins, the little boy. Yeah. How about Ty blowing up, huh? Ty Star of like Jurassic World. And, yeah. yeah. Uh, so crazy. Um, so catch me up on where you're at because I'm so excited about this show you've created and star in um, Studio City, just uh, thematically in terms of what I'm exploring and then your own journey. Like what's it been like wearing these multiple hats and also portraying this mm. character and creating a show? <laughs> right. Um, this has been a project of love and passion for me for a long time. I've been trying to get it made for over a decade and through the right series of uh, contacts and relationships and through some tremendous work from my wife, Michelle, uh, we were able to put it together and uh, we did our first six shows which are streaming on Amazon Prime and it was incredible. We were nominated for eight Emmys and 12 Indie Series Awards uh, the first year, which, you know, who expects that? And totally. uh, congrats. Thank you. And we, we just finished shooting. We're going to see if it's another five or six episodes. We are literally in editing as we speak. And, uh, you know, filming, filming during uh, 
the pandemic is not without its challenges to say the least, but we've got a bunch of really, really talented, dedicated people uh, in front and behind the camera. And so I think we are gonna bring everybody something that's uh, equally, if not more fun and interesting and compelling than we did the first time around. And uh, fingers crossed, it'll be on at the end of this month. Oh, perfect. Um, yeah. So the premise of the show and how mm. that character relates to your own personal backstory. Right. You know, they, they always say write what you know. And um, I've, been, I've been producing uh, for over 20 years now. But uh, uh, the story centers around my character, Sam Stevens, who plays Dr. Pierce Hartley on the number two soap opera in the world called Hearts on Fire. And, you know, he's a guy that ostensibly, when you see him, you think he's got the world by the tail. But in reality, as the onion starts to un unpeel, you realize that this guy is dealing with a lot of problems and, and issues that many people deal with and quite a few that they don't. He is, you know, no longer the young guy on the soap opera. He's, uh, you know, he's, he's, you know, he's an aging soap star. And, and that comes with its own series of um, anxieties and insecurities and challenges. Uh, he's got all sorts of family issues. And he's a guy that always felt that he should have had a, a bigger career in his mind. And in his mind, that was being an action star. And at the end of the pilot, uh, somebody shows up that he never knew existed. And mm -hmm. it throws his entire life into chaos and turmoil. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting show. It's, uh, it's a digital drama, but there's a lot of humor in it. And the episodes run between 10 and 15 minutes, so it's really easily digestible. Uh, you can probably watch the entire first season in 90 minutes and get <laughs> caught up. And, um, you know, for me, I mean, it's like, you know, I, I've worked in the world of, of soap operas off and on for 30 years. So, you know, this is something that I'm intimately familiar with. And so I, I would say that in a lot of ways, this character is the closest to me than any other character uh, I've ever played. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a, a lot of the dialogue and stuff that I write and stuff that I say in everyday life. And while the character undergoes some circumstances uh, and situations that I haven't undergone firsthand, it, it, it really is a character that's pretty similar to me. I, I like to think that maybe I'm a little more evolved and self-actualized <laughs> than my character, Sam. Uh, you know, he kind of lived, he's kind of lived in this bubble. and. It, He's, he's lived in the bubble of sort of B minus fame for most of his life. And, and with that comes a lot of, um, you know, there's certain things he just doesn't get because it's not normal to grow up, you know, being a TV star. Um, and there's some entitlement that comes with that. And there's some, you know, not really always thinking of other people that comes with that. And he's kind of learning the hard way. And uh, that's, that's a lot of fun for me to play that. That's really, really cool. I'm definitely into um, this like meta connection between yep. art and life. <laughs> For sure. Um, hence humanizing the icon. And I wanted to ask you, how does that phrase resonate to you? Well, <laughs> well, first of all, I'm, I'm extremely flattered that I would uh, be on any show that would refer to me as an icon, but, um, and I'm humbled. Um, I think it's interesting because I think the deconstruction of people's perceptions of mm -hmm. someone who is a quote unquote icon or somewhere, someone that they're familiar with in pop culture, it's very interesting, I think, not always, but, but can be very interesting to separate the person from the sort of public image and find out where there are common denominators and find out where there are stark diversions. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I like this idea. I think it's cool. I mean, you know, I, one of the, my, my favorite shows, it was, um, you know, the actor's studio with the late James Lipton. And it was always great to see these, these icons sitting down and, and, you know, being asked questions about not just the work that they've done, but, but their lives. And it's, I, I, I'm, I'm equally as interested. This is, this is a show that your show, I will be watching. Um, <laughs> Thanks. Not just because, not just because now I'm, I'm a guest, but I, I, I find the concept very interesting. So in terms of icon, I mean, soap operas in and of itself, like conceptually, 
like are iconic, right? Like, especially for the era they were birthed in and over the years they were um, so in the forefront, like the specific so- I would, I would agree with that. Yeah. You know, I would, I would agree with that. Um, I was in General Hospital for years and, you know, General Hospital started out as uh, a radio show. And then it went to being a black and white show, and you know, and, and now it's it's in its current incarnation. And <clears throat> Bold and the Beautiful, which I was also on for years, it was the world's most syndicated show. It's in the Guinness World Book of Records, and I say okay. that because um, you know it was in at one time I think a hundred different countries, and so that is absolutely iconic. And when you join a show like that that has so much um, pre-existing history. Mm -hmm. um, very quickly, you become very associated and known with that show. And, and so you're kind of, you know, it's kind of like uh, uh, the instant soup of icon. You know, it's, it's kind of like when you join the New York Yankees. I mean, you know, you're, you're joining yes. an iconic group. And, and if, you, if you last, you know, you tend to, I guess, for better or for worse, uh, reap the benefits and association with the, the project that's been around and, and is so widely uh, distributed. Did you ever feel like you were portraying an iconic character? Um, Cause those characters I mean, were so beloved. Yeah, I, I mean, my I, mom I was I, I obsessed. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I did to an extent. I, I hope that doesn't sound so no. important, but, um, I was the uh, black sheep son of the Quartermain family, and the Quartermain family has been the core family on General Hospital. And, uh, you know, I also came on the show at a time, not in the golden age of soaps, which I think was the 80s, like the, the Luke and Laura, but they were still on. But I was on in the early 90s, and Ricky Martin was on the show, and Vanessa Marcel, and, you know, we had a huge following. Um, we were also dealing with some really important social issues on the show, uh, one of which was uh, one of the characters uh, was HIV positive and eventually developed AIDS. And, you know, mm -hmm. at that time, that was really at the vanguard of media and everyone was talking about it. So to that extent, yes. And then when I was on Bold and the Beautiful, um, I was amazed at how my character Deacon Sharp took off. He was just such a bad guy. You know, he got his mother-in-law pregnant and had a baby with her and, you know, all this scandalous stuff. And, and again, as I said, the show is so popular in other countries, specifically in Italy. Um, and it, it just opened up a whole world for me uh, of, of other countries where, where people knew who I was. I, I actually um, did a film over in Italy and then I did Dancing with the Stars in Italy and lived over there. So I have a very, very strong um, connection to Italy and it's, it's a wow. direct result of, of uh, having been on Bold and Beautiful. Wow, that's actually really powerful. Well, something else I've been, I guess, deconstructing is the era we're in now. I mean, mm -hmm. COVID has become iconic, right? That's going to go down. Yeah, yeah for so sure. So we've like opened up the, the conversation beyond, you know, just pop culture, fame type of icon. Mm -hmm. There's spirituality, there's religion, mythology, eras. Icon by definition means image, you know. Um, so what do you think about the landscape of today right now um, as an artist and within COVID? And what do you hope that the silver lining is? Mm. It's funny, for some reason, um, I'm, I'm struck by, uh, there's a book by a guy named Marshall McLuhan, who if you're a Woody Allen fan, you might remember from Annie Hall. And uh, Woody Allen is in line at this movie and there's a guy that's just this blowhard talking about film theory and talking about Marshall McLuhan's book. And Woody Allen leans out of frame and just brings Marshall McLuhan. And the guy says, you know, you know nothing of my fallacy, you're an idiot, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, his book was called The Medium. Is, <laughs> the reason, there's a, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly yeah. back. So, yeah. so the reason I'm saying this is that there's uh, his book, which is very famous in uh, schools of communication, is called The Medium is the Message. Mm -hmm. And it, the essence of it, as I understand it, is, is that sometimes the way with which we choose to speak to each other, to communicate, 
is more important than the words that are actually said. Um, yes. You know, somebody breaks up with you over a text that says a lot more than if they chose to, you know, do it in person. So circling back, you know, because of COVID, um, so much of the communication that we have right now is exactly like we're talking now. It is, it has not spawned a new form of communication, but it has, um, it has diffused it on a much wider level where this is normally how people mass communicate. Um, which I think is great. I think it's, it's wonderful that we have this option. My, my hope is that during this time, um, people have been able to realize what's important and who's important. And when we're all able to finally communicate consistently in person, that we will remember that there was a time when we couldn't. And we will learn to cherish and value each other more. So like gratitude and absolutely deeper connection, like unification. You know, yeah. you know, appreciation for each other that, uh, you know, I don't know if, you know, you feel that, but I mean, you know, when I'm, I, I haven't seen my parents in well over mm -hmm. a year and, uh, you know, next time I see them, I, I think there's going to be a, a deeper sense of resonance that, you know, I'm lucky to be seeing them in person because there was a time when I couldn't. Yeah. That's, that's what I'm taking away from them. And where are they again? Uh, they're in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Okay. Do you, do you Zoom with them? You know, I, I don't Zoom a whole lot with them, but I talk to them probably like four or five times a week. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm kind of a mom's boy that way. <laughs> nice. <laughs> that's, that's so cute. <laughs> um, okay. So I wanted to also, to circle back to the episodes of your show being, um, you said 15 to 20 minutes, right? No, they're shorter. They're shorter. They're like 10 to, I think that the longest one last season was maybe 17 minutes, the, the finale, but they are, uh, yeah, they're, uh, they're definitely short form, uh, which is interesting because, you know, there's a lot of challenges with that. You've got very limited canvas to paint your, your, your picture, right? I mean, so it moves at a really fast clip. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think in a lot of ways, that mirrors the society that we live in now. I mean, That's we live what, very yeah. much in a nano, you know, in a nano bit society where people, you know, want to watch their entertainment when they want it, where they want it, and now on what device they want it. But the f another aspect of that is, that you know, people often now communicate in a more truncated and abbreviated and faster way, um, largely because you know we've got so many technological um, uh, things at our, at our fingertips. You know, I mean, it's like you know, you whip off a quick text, or da 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 da. And I guess that also dovetails back to what I was saying that I I hope that when this is all over, that you know, we will sort of recapture the fine art of conversation. Uh, you know? Yes. So what, what made you decide to do it that format? Just going with the flow uh, of the to, zeitgeist? To, to, be or? No, to be really honest, I mean, that was part of it. Um, you know, a lot of it was, uh, it had to do with the amount of money that we had to make it. You know, we had to decide what was the best format for the resources that we had. But now we like this format. I mean, I think ultimately we would love to move to a uh, full 30 minute show. And I think that's something that's probably going to happen once we uh, shift into worldwide distribution. Mm -hmm. But right now, um, and with the success we had uh, of the first episodes, we, it ain't broke. We, we don't want to fix it right now. Because, yeah. because telling a story over 30 minutes is very different than telling a story over you know 10 to 12 minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And so also following up in terms of similarities, common ground between you and your character, like deeper traits, like what are some of the qualities you feel like you're really channeling from your own experience? I think that my character, Sam, has a very healthy dose of self-deprecation and I, I, I think I do too. Okay. Um, I, I think he's funny and I, you know, I, I, I definitely, um, Humor is something that I 
I don't know if I hide behind it sometimes or, uh, you know, but, but that's something that's a part of who I am. Um, and I think that he's, there is a depth to this guy. I mean, there is a pathos to this guy, but you got to kind of really get in there. And I, you know, I just think maybe I'm a little more after a lot of therapy and, you know, being married and everything else. I think I'm, I'm a lot more in touch with that maybe than the character is, but I do my best to bring that to the character. Do you think he'll evolve in that way? Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Look, here's the thing. In life, we're always trying to evolve. We're trying to improve our relationship, you know, improve our efficacy in business and things like that, have a broader platform to kind of talk and have our voice heard, whether it's, you know, creative or, or otherwise. But basically, to make our lives simpler and better and more meaningful right? But when you're creating a character on a show, you want to heap as many obstacles on that character. Yes. So that he's constantly swimming through mud, struggling <laughs> to try and do what we in life try and do. It's, it's almost like the complete inverse. Yes. I love your passion when you talk about this. <laughs> I totally feel that. Um, okay. So humanizing the icon, I want to know what does even humanizing mean to you? Like to humanize hmm. something or someone, I, you know, famous I, or not famous, just humanizing. I, I, I guess it's kind of pulling back the facade that, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, media and, and, the art and all that stuff, maybe not the facade, but also the buffer that it creates sometimes between the individual and the people looking at the individual. And I think it's showing what really are the fundamental uh, bare essence qualities of a person. And, um, you know, that's going to be the trick for you to do that because as much as artists and actors generally like to talk about themselves, um, they also are very, and I, when I say this, I, I talk about myself, you know, they're very adept at showing you what they want to show you mm -hmm. and keeping what they don't want to show you. But I think most people are like that. So I think one of the, one of the things that makes, I don't know, even Howard Stern, you know, such a great interviewer is he's mm -hmm. got this ability to strip away the artifice from people, even when they sort of don't see it coming or know it's happening. And that gives you, a peek behind the curtain and you know you know if, 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 if your show and if you were able to do that that's something that's going to be really interesting that's something that I think is humanizing and do you think people know what they're not exposing I think sometimes I think there's the things that we keep to ourselves and don't want to expose and they're the things about us that we're disconnected from mm -hmm. and don't show. And there's the things about us that we have yet to discover that we don't show. All of those things can be shown and brought out. But I think, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's things that are um, intentionally kept under wraps. And then there's the stuff that uh, is under wraps because maybe we have yet to discover it and get in touch with it. So... Let the healing begin. I'm all for you humanizing me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm about to ask you something. Myself. I'm about to ask you something personal now. Um, okay. Do you, you know, you've come up in this industry a long time. You've been, like you said, portraying different characters, mm -hmm. dealing with being in the public to varying degrees. Um, and that heightens things a lot. I mean, you know, we know that actors are humans and we all go through experiences of feeling overexposed, whether we're in the public or not. Um, and there's a lot of vulnerability in that. Um, but for you, has there been an aspect of your personality that you didn't want to expose? That you, as you've done the work and done the therapy, you've gotten more comfortable with showing like uh, this raw sure, aspect of, of course. yourself. Of course, I mean, listen. Okay. You know, you know, every, everybody has demons. Everybody has a dark side. Everybody has 
things that are still in process within them. And um, a lot of times when you're working in the entertainment industry and uh, politics, I imagine, is much the same uh, when, when you're or, or sports, et cetera. You know, when you're in a business where you're being scrutinized, sometimes very closely and sometimes not as closely, but you, you sometimes have to work out difficult periods in your life uh, that, you know, are, have been brought to the public's attention. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so. So more like um, behavior or events, you know, because I'm thinking like, both. I mean, yeah. Both, I mean, like, listen, I, I was divorced and um, it would be much easier to go through a divorce, um, you know, not being in, uh, the inquirer or something like that than being in it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But it is what it is. So yeah, there are times that, um, um, there are things that in, in my life that I've dealt with that would have been much easier to deal with if I could do it, uh, you know, on a mountaintop in Tibet, but, uh, you know, this is the, yes, this, this is the life, this is the life that I chose. And this life also has some tremendous benefits to it. So you take the good with the bad. Or challenging. I don't, you know, I don't like to say bad. I don't like to assign binary um, qualifications to things because I'm a big proponent of the fact that very often we don't see what the big picture is. And, um, you know, I think as, as painful, say, as my divorce was uh, many, many years ago, had that not happened, I wouldn't have met my beautiful wife, Michelle, who's my soulmate. And it opened me up to the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. So what initially seems like it may be negative and bad may wind up being one of the best things the universe could provide you with. Yeah, definitely. I've been into some of that kind of, um, kind of it's like a non-dualism mm -hmm. way of seeing things as whole and neutral. Cause it's like, it flows, yeah. What seems bad is not, and well, I, I think, think that, I think also when you yeah. when you when you assign something um, as, when, when you assign something as being bad or negative, it immediately affects your emotionality. Yeah, and you're also not living in the present because what you're doing is you're anticipating a conclusion that may not happen. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, how many times like, we've all heard the, you know, the, um, the, the uh, acronym for fear, false evidence appearing real. How many times have things that we have dreaded never come to pass? Mm -hmm. And very often when things that we do dread do come to pass, rarely in life, I think, are things as bad as we think they are. And conversely, rarely in life are things as good. And, and. By that, I mean, you know, it's, it's kind of that middle path. It's kind of like, you know, don't allow yourself to get spun out of control because something amazing has happened. But mm -hmm. conversely, don't get spun out of control when something that ostensibly seems like it's really difficult and challenging because probably the truth is somewhere closer to the middle. Exactly. And when they talk about emotions as like energy in motion, it's really just yes. all energy that wants to move through you. So if you don't get right. stuck on the story of the event. Story. That's a, you know, I, I, have, I have a new book coming out. It's called Way of the Cobra. I might as well plug it now. Oh, yeah. And, plug it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And if, if anyone is interested in pre And I love that name, uh, by the way. Thank you. You can go to yeah. wayofthecobra.com and the introduction from the book is there and it will give you a very clear idea of what, what it's about. And it's, it's a book about success and philosophy and and um, you know, inspiration, and it's a lot of the battle-hardened strategies that I've uh, used uh, throughout the course of my life. I mean, you know, last year I wrote um, I wrote an Amazon new release bestseller called Success Factor X. Mm. Created, you know, Studio City, and uh, I also lost thirty-five pounds. And it's like I don't say that to impress you, but I say it to impress upon you what's possible. And I've, I've shared a lot of that stuff in this book and with the success of, you know, Cobra Kai and Karate Kid and my having been in the Karate Kid universe, um, it, the book is formatted as if I'm a sensei in a dojo 
and these are my students. And you know, I, 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 I think I communicate in a way that is, is, is funny and cheeky. And also, you know, I, I, I like to think I drop some knowledge in it. And I wrote this book because I really do believe that this stuff works. I know it's worked for me and I'd like to share it with people and hopefully um, help and inspire people. So do you work with the law of attraction like intentionally? You know, I, I, I believe in that. I mean, it's not mm -hmm. specifically, look, here's the thing. On the very first page of the book, I talk about this. There's two things that you gotta do. The first thing is you need to realize that where you are is who you are. Every decision that you've made, both the good ones and the questionable ones, have brought you to this moment in your life. Mm -hmm. And there's no room for blame. There's no room for victimhood in my dojo. You have to accept it if you're gonna make breakthroughs. The second yes. thing is you have to accept the fact that the universe wants you to be a winner. It's in every, it's, it's embedded in our DNA to survive, mm -hmm. right? For 200,000 years, um, you know, we, we eluded T-Rexes when we were not the apex predators and human beings survived. And survival is the very basis of success. Can't succeed if you're not alive. So the <laughs> point is, the, the deck is stacked towards wanting you to succeed. And I think a lot of people, you know, they get, they get caught up in that, that woe is me victimhood, everyone's yeah. against me, you know, and that's bullshit. It's complete bullshit. And so once you accept those two things, um, you know, then I talk about defining your success. And by that, I mean, you know, not the success that's portrayed by Madison Avenue commercials, not the success that is some, you know, um, spoiled celebrities, over bloated Instagram feed, because here's the thing, people's, people's outward lives rarely match their true lives. Okay, there you go. trust me, mm -hmm. I live in Hollywood. And you know, my uncle had this great saying, and I don't think he came up with it, but I'm, I'm attributing it to him anyway. Yeah. He said, things aren't always what they seem. Skin milk masquerades as cream. And I love that because, I've got you know, chills. We, I've yeah, got and it's chills. like, it's like, it's like, you know, if you compare yourself to other people's success, you are going to be consistently in the state of feeling like you're not enough. Um, you know, I, I tell a story in my book that I was in acting class with Brad Pitt and obviously our careers have taken some different <laughs> directions, Sure. you know, sure. but, but the fact of the matter is I'm, I'm not only happy for him because he's a really good guy. But that was his journey. This is my journey. And, and you just can't compare yourself to anyone other than yourself. That's the reality. Well, this so is like very, this is very aligned because this term that I've been like a little fixated on in terms of contemplation lately is radical acceptance. Mm. And I feel I like, like um, you just talked about radical acceptance and sometimes term, like that. people that i've said that to mm -hmm. think that means something apathetic or blase or not with with motion or, or movement and i, I can have see to how they think that but i don't think that's what it is no you have to explain it the way you did which is that in order for breakthroughs to happen in order to right. have space for what you're calling in, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I feel like you have to radically accept exactly where you are right now. Because Absolutely. otherwise your energy is being used, wishing you were somewhere else, rather yeah, I, than I, allowing for those. You're not, living in the, you're not living in the present then. You know, I would take it one step further and I would say radical sure. acceptance should apply to other people too, in the sense that, yes. you know, so yeah. often human beings chase their tail trying to change other people. Now, I do believe there are two things that can change people. I believe that p human beings can change because of love and because of fear. I do believe that. But, but unless, I mean, and, and the only way to change somebody is by, is by, by loving them. But you gotta accept them for who they are in that moment. Or you're gonna make yourself crazy. I mean, how many, you know, how many people you know, go crazy because they've got some weird relationship with their mother and they're like, oh, I can just change my mom and the way she, you know, you're not gonna do it. You're not gonna do it. You gotta take her the way she is and just love her. And in doing that, maybe the relationship will change. But, you know, that to me is, is radical acceptance. Yes, and oftentimes what's super triggering to us about those other people and relationships are 
really an opportunity for self-reflection. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you can lead by example. You can plant seeds by being inspirational. I think if you use so much energy to be a professor or try to change people, you're mm -hmm. not really doing the work on yourself. And that's, yep. I think, where like the vibration can really elevate is if we each do the self. You hit the nail on the head. Absolutely. You're, you're spot on. I can't believe that you wrote a book on these things. Yeah, this is my third book. Um, so yeah, I really, you, you know, it, listen, it, I'd love you to buy my book, okay? But, but please go and at least check out the introduction. Uh, the introduction is on uh, the landing page, which is still in, in constru under construction, but you can see it, and it's uh, waythecobra.com. And uh, I think you get a really healthy flavor for what the book is about, uh, just from the introduction. Very, very I think, cool. I think people like it, yeah. And do you think that our ideas around icon and we can even be more specific to celebrity are shifting now? Like does that same version of icon as we knew decades ago exist anymore? And is this new digital world also deconstructing our yeah, ideas? You know, I, he has, is everyone sort of trying to become but like, curate themselves well, within the landscape of you know, it's like Andy Warhol said, everyone will have their 15 minutes of fame. And I think everybody, um, I think people, a lot of people are trying to do that um, and express themselves through social media and things like that, which I think that's fine. I think, I think that's wonderful. I think um, that, you know, the, the concept of icons, if I had to guess, was probably at its, a, its apex during like the studio system, um, you know, in like the, the 30s and 40s, when, when actors' images were carefully manicured, um, you know, when there was a lot less choices out there for what you did for entertainment. I mean, you know, baseball players were, were gods then, Mickey Mantle, you know, Babe Ruth before that. You know, now we've got, we've got so many different options for people that could be conceived as, or, or you know, thought of as icons that I think maybe the term is used a little loosely. Mm -hmm. um, um, and like I said, as flattered as I am to be a part of the show, I, I certainly wouldn't consider you know, myself an icon. Um, you know, I, you think about it, for me, I think of an icon you know, as an artist, you know, I think of Da Vinci, I think of you know, modern day, you know, Andy Warhol, Salvador Dali, um, and, and you know, different ones in baseball and football. I think also that our society really loves to create an icon, kind of a, a little tin god, and then they love to watch that icon fall. Yeah. Just so they can swoop in and bring he or she back up again. So, so what about this? Because this has come of these conversations too. And what if, there's a couple things, like what if we're all icons? You know, we're all projections, icon oh. means image. And what if the human, is really the icon we're exploring, that's, we're that's trying brilliant. to figure, you know? That's brilliant, I love that because, you know, another, I hate to keep going back to my book, but no, go you know, for another it. thing I, I, I talk about is I believe that everybody has a masterpiece within themselves. And that masterpiece is living your most authentic life, mm -hmm. being who you really are, transmitting that to the world, and in turn, affecting other people to do the same. And so I believe that everybody, Everybody has the potential to be an icon if you're living your best self, you're living your best life, and you're passing it on to other people to empower them to do the same. It's interesting that people tend to reference icon on the high level humanitarian, like, I care about humanity mm -hmm. and I'm living for the purpose of contribution in a way. What mm -hmm. about the iconic perpetrator or Hitler? Are these icons in your, through your lens? For me, it's open for, for, to me, it. for, yeah. for me, icon has a positive connotation. Okay. Um, uh, I mean, I, I suppose they're iconic because they are associated, for, for instance, Hitler with evil and destruction mm -hmm. and the rest of that. Um, you know, Charles Manson, I think, is iconic. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think it's, I'd like to see the term, you know, have a more positive connotation and not reward people for, you know, 
cruel and horrendous and evil behavior, uh, but rather for, for, for being kind or for, you know, doing something that really contributes to the world, either artistically or, you know, you know Dr. Jonas Salt, who cured polio, that's an icon. You know what I mean? You know, uh, Christian Barnard, who did the first heart transplant, that's an icon. Okay, yeah. um, and I think, I think that raises the question of, do you have to be widespread famous to be an icon? In my opinion, no. Um, you know, if you ask the average kid right now who, you know, uh, you know, who, who Jonas Salt was, they're gonna have no idea, you know? Mm -hmm. But the reason that they're not walking with braces and crutches is because they've all been given a polio vaccine. So to me, that's pretty iconic. And then what about idolization? I mean, is it possible that these certain qualities are iconic? So we're seeking something, this idea of worship or idolization, are we seeking something that we actually embody? Like the collective has yeah. made the icon. Yeah, I, th I think that, you know, when we see icons, we try and recognize some of those characteristics within ourselves. And, you know, I think icons are great if they serve to inspire and, and push you to become your best and, and, you know, get in touch with those qualities that we, mm -hmm. we, we attribute to icons. Um, you know, I, I, I talk a lot about mentorship in my book and, and, but you can almost, use this about icons you know i lived in this small town of western pennsylvania and i would go to the movies and i didn't realize it as a way of escape to look beyond my horizon and you know, i didn't realize it but at the time when i was a kid you know clint eastwood the outlaw josie wales obi-wan kenobi alec guinness bruce lee these were my mentors mm -hmm. you know these were individuals who were iconic but were imparting to, to me at least certain qualities that either I wish I had or maybe I knew I had that were embryonic and you know wanted to nurture them. So mm -hmm. um, I, I think I think icons are important, but I also think this process of deconstructing them uh, is important too. Yeah, because it can become dangerous, right? Like idolization I feel like can also um like permeate this feeling of unworthiness that I think is kind of mm. like an epidemic in our, in our society and in our, right. um, within humans, this sense of like lower self, low self esteem or this sense of like needing to curate, like you're saying an inauthentic image in order to mm -hmm. literally be loved. Um, so I feel like idolization can play a part in people feeling like that is outside of them and I yeah, am not that. That's you know? the thing. I think people need to recognize, listen, I, I firmly believe everybody is given a gift at birth. Mm -hmm. You may not know what it is and you know, it may take you a while to discover it, but most, almost everybody has a gift. And if not, you know, hopefully you find something that you really love in this world and you get good at it and that becomes your gift. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I do think it's it's equally as important this process of, of of deconstructing the icon too, because I think it's important that icons are not put on a pedestal to the point yes. where it, it you know it should be to inspire rather than to awe. Do you know what yes. I mean? Yes. You know, I, I'm not interested in 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 you know bowing down to the radiating you know rays of any icon unless I can see something that I want to strive for that they have. And I'm not talking about, you know, a yacht or, you know, jewelry or fancy cars, but what quality do they have mm -hmm. that has helped them achieve icon status mm -hmm. that I need to refine or get in touch with in myself. And then that to me is what an icon is. Yes. That's like true art. That's like being yeah. inspired by a work of art. Um, which I, I think we are all works of art. <laughs> I, I agree with you. I really believe that too. Now, I think some people um, lose touch with that. And I think some people unfortunately allow negativity and, 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 and bad things to obscure that. Mm -hmm. But I think for most people, you know, I would say probably like 95% of the population, you've got the legitimate chance to, you know, 
live your best life and be your best self. And it doesn't mean that you have to uh, have a lot of money or anything like that. Listen, you know, I talk, I keep doing this. I, I, I talk about this story in my book about success. And I say, most people would not associate a guy that worked as a janitor for 30 years as being a success. There's nothing wrong with doing that. There's, there's, um, you know, there's honor in, in having a job and all that, but it's not the first thing that comes to everybody's mind, right? Okay, mm -hmm. but what if that guy, some immigrant janitor, saved every dollar he had and put his only daughter through medical school and she became a life-saving research scientist? I just got chills I again. Say, I yeah. would say that guy is a pretty successful guy. Mm -hmm. That to me is, that to me is a success. Uh. So that, that's why we've got to like define what your success is, not what somebody yeah. else's and find yours. And in doing that and achieving that to me, you become an icon. Ah, oh, that's so well said. I love right. that. Now We're I'm going to go retreat like... to my, my place up on the mountaintop in Tibet. So no. Okay. Perfect. Go <laughs> Wait, right listen, to next. Listen, listen, I'm not telling you guys anything you don't already know. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not reinventing the wheel here. This is all information that everybody knows. Um, I, I think sometimes um, it comes in a different package. This is my package. So maybe my package speaks to you. You know what I mean? That didn't sound good. Um, <laughs> but, but, I mean, but I mean, maybe the, maybe, you know, maybe the way that I'm imparting this information, you know, resonates with you where maybe it doesn't and, and somebody else saying the same thing before in your life or later in your life will. So I think we tend to hear, I think there's certain things that are universal truths and that are universal knowledge. And it might take multiple times to hear them in different incarnations, but I think certain things are undeniable. The simplest of which is the golden rule. You know, do unto others as you have them do unto you. So it's like, uh, not like, a, not like a, an esoteric concept. It's the most basic concept. Mm -hmm. Yet sometimes it takes decades for that to really sink into people before they can start demonstrating in their life. And then, you know, I think the, the, the next evolution upward is to pass it on to others and help them do the same thing. And yet it's so simple. I know it's so simple. And yet people don't even think about right. how they want to treat themselves or how they want other people to treat them. It seems right. like such an intuitive thing. And then mm, when you're like, how do you want to be treated? It's like, Okay, I actually have to think about that. Write a, some, write a think, personal constitution. I think some of that comes from the fact that, you know, people don't always treat themselves very well. Exactly. exactly. You, know, another thing, you know, another thing I talk about is I, I talk about the fact that, you know, you know, thoughts and words have consequence in the sense that, you know, and, and, and I'm guilty of this too, and it's something that I've become more aware of and I work harder at. But you know how many times you go, oh, I'm such an asshole, or I'm such an idiot, blah, 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 blah. and you're you're bombarding yourself yes. with this negative tape that's running. And if, if you're telling yourself you're an asshole, how you know how are you gonna always not treat other people like that if that's how you see yourself? So it yes. starts with being kind and good to yourself, and then hopefully very quickly doing the same to others. It has like a ripple effect, yeah. For sure. This is amazing. So we're going to wrap up on Instagram and then go to Facebook and hear about Chelio's drawing. Um, do you want to say any final words? To Instagram I just want, to, I just want to thank if, I want to thank everybody for taking the time out of their day. I know everyone's busy. I appreciate you um, uh, listening to me and to Jen. Um, I'm going to give the uh, uh, address one more time. It's wayofthecobra.com. Please check it out uh, and um, be good to each other. Be good. Stay yes. safe. Have a wonderful holiday. That's beautiful. Yes. Thank you for tuning in. Okay. And the full episode with Chelio's drawing um, will be on the YouTube channel, Humanizing Excellent. the Icon. Okay. Right, so I'm going to sign off of Instagram. Keep us on Facebook. Okay. So now. Hey, the Chelio. I can turn up the volume now on the computer. Yeah. Hi, Chelio. Hey guys, very nice, beautiful discussion today. And I feel a very deep energy and what's up from this discussion, very honest from today, I love it. It's coming all angel. Wow. It's all angel, but uh, he is his true icon and build 
on life, for life, with the experience from all experienced oh. soul be from before. That's beautiful. So, so beautiful. Is wow. a, a very strong spin. Uh, is uh, the the angel uh, help because no, no, uh, with experience from before from the other souls and then and soul building a strong spin. You so. It's, wow, there's a face in there. I see. It's many souls. Many souls. And, and uh, he, but. Wow, tell you. Did you see? He's not watch. He's not watch us. He's watch ahead. It's like before. It's like because you have to deserve because other people do the same. You have to deserve my help, my light. Because my light is built from before, from the old experience. Then okay. I am like I am the icon. You have to that believe in so me. That is so powerful. Do you really? have to believe in me? Because I am the light. I am the icon, and then I help you when you deserve. And then when you deserve, I turn my face, and then I watch you. Do you understand? <laughs> is my point of view because uh, um, uh, I'm a fluid artist and then I don't think what I do and then all coming automatically uh, in building on your discussion today it's very beautiful and uh, that looks like really like such a powerful like archetypal entity of like Reminds me of Lucifer, you know. I, I mean, know. Lucifer was the you know the angel that, the angel of light that fell, uh, and oh, he, yeah. he went from being beautiful to not beautiful, but it's 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 fascinating. Yeah, um, that's a really different than I've seen you do, Chelia. That's really. Uh, is 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 the discussion from today? I know that's our energy, Sean, right there. Thank you. <laughs> Interesting. Wow. Wow. Um, did, he, did that entire thing while during the course of our conversation? Yeah, in the episode, he was drawing live. Yeah. That whole thing with a pen. Wow, I love a copy of that. That's amazing. We'll send it to you. You can post it too. It's so beautiful. For sure, I would like to do yeah. that. Yeah. Jen, I, I'm, I'm unfortunately going to have to say goodbye. Yeah, let's say goodbye. Gonna... This is great. Elio, thank you so much for your beautiful artwork. And thank you, everyone, for, uh, for joining us. And Jen, it was so good to see you. After let's your stay in touch. I would love that, okay? Okay. Sending... All right, take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.